on, in fact, to our first chair, Case Hulse. Case is a very old colleague of mine from WHO, long-standing colleague of mine, I should say, from WHO days. <laughs> Case, par excellence, is someone that uh, creates discussion and creates debate. So thank you, Case, for chairing the, the first session that now follows. Pleasure, Peter. Thank you. Thanks very much, Peter. Um, my task is very easy. Uh, I'm chairing this session, which lasts until 13 hours, and then we'll have a break. Uh, I mean, you can all read the program, so I don't have to read out who is going to speak first and second, and so on. It's all very obvious. Why worry about addictions? That's the theme of our first session. And we'll have Jürgen as our first speaker. I don't have to introduce Jürgen. He has been introduced already. Everybody knows Jürgen. Jürgen comes from Dresden, but he comes also from Toronto. But you can find Jürgen in all sorts of places all over the world, in lounges. I met him once sitting in a lounge in Moscow, working very hard on another article. Uh, Jürgen, it's a pleasure to welcome you and to ask you to speak to us about the harm from addictions. Jürgen. Thank you. Remote. Thanks for the nice words. Good morning. And now you hear me even louder. Basically, what I'm trying to walk you through is the newest harm figures for the European Union. They're based on 2013. And I will also look not only on health harms, but also on other harms. Uh, I'll bite whatever is possible in 15 minutes. So what are the previous approaches currently when we speak about harm or burden? We speak about the global burden of diseases, injuries, and risk factors. And that has been as if it was a monolithic approach. But basically, those of you who do the games like I do and have to check those numbers know that the website is updated every single month. And so uh, the overall harm figures do change. And within LSREP, we have contributed to those changes in a significant way. And what we found here has been impacting not only on the burden of disease figures, but also on all of the WHO publications and on uh, a lot of the country publications. Now, let's go to DEFs. Uh, I come from another meeting. We talked about DEFs in uh, discussed that it's maybe an overrated uh, thing, but uh, since we're all living here, I think we are very happy that we are not dead. And um, what does it mean in terms of deaths from addictions? Well, first of all, this is not addictions. These are deaths from substances. They're mainly from heavy use over time because the curves, the risk curves are mainly exponential, but these include all deaths from substances. And if you want to have one number, it is one million deaths per, uh, for the European Union, all the 30 plus countries, uh, in the year 2013. And if you look into the different substance classes, and there's no good data on, on gambling, and there's also a very complicated relationship between gambling and deaths, uh, which I cannot go into, you see that tobacco is the overall most important by far, followed by alcohol. Somebody switched it for me, that's nice, but I'm going back. Uh, uh, and overall, we uh, see uh, alcohol as a second and illicit uh, drugs as a third. These different um, modes and these different substances are killing people at different times in, during lifetime. And tobacco kills people later in life, alcohol more in life, so the relative proportion 
of alcohol becomes more important once we go into other measures like years of life lost. Basically, here are all the measures which are usually discussed, years of life lost in Dallas. Dallas is also having the non-fatal parts of alcohol. And you see that for alcohol, the relative uh, contribution is getting more than for deaths, and this is even more true for illicit drug use in Europe. Tobacco still is the most dominant substance in uh, this as well. And if you go into uh, those comparisons, you see they're coming a little bit closer together, but still tobacco is the one substance which is uh, killing most people and which is costing most of the years of life lost. If you go into the third one, the dailies, you see um, the similar picture. Again, this is very much dependent on how you value the functionality losses attributable to different substances, how you value that attributable to different diseases which are caused by these substances. Uh, we have talked about uh, harm to others before. A lot of governments by now are actually asking us about better harm to others data. That has to do with some kind of rethinking. It also has to do that a lot of governments has be have become more conservative in the European Union, and they're more concerned about the harm to others and protecting others than protecting the user themselves. This is, a class, uh, this is a classical welfare state concept. So this has to do with this shift on harm to others. When we look into harm to others, basically this is one of the biggest success stories we are having in public health. If we look into numbers between 1990 and 2013, the harm to others from tobacco is actually going down over proportionally, way more proportionally than the harm to the substance user themselves. And that is something we should keep in mind. Harm to others of tobacco has gotten all the limelight, even though I know somebody wants to speed me up, but I will still uh, spend disproportional time on those slides. Um, and basically, uh, the harm to others from tobacco has getting the limelight, but it's only, uh, it is 6% of all of the deaths and 7% of the dallies of tobacco overall, but proportionally, the harm to others from alcohol is likely to be more important. I say likely because uh, for some reason, in alcohol research, we have concentrated on not trying to produce those numbers. Only after 15 years, uh, we are now, for the first time, trying to produce those numbers on a global level. There had been efforts, obviously, in different countries. Australia did a wonderful harm to other study. And there are other countries who have tried to, to give that. But overall, it, is, it was not in the limelight. For drugs, we are just now coming into harm to others studies, which could be done in a framework of those uh, global burden and other studies. If we go into a different mindset and we go away from the harm to others, which can be measured in deaths, in dailies, in health months, uh, David Nutt and his colleagues have done a study where they integrate a lot of other dimensions. They integrated via expert judgments into one value, into one scaling. And this is probably one of the most shown slides overall. Um, it, for UK, this is the, the one which is for, uh, for Europe as a whole. And basically, you see that alcohol's overall harm is mainly based, or to the majority, based on harm to society rather than harm to the user. <laughs> 
we can have the same kind of scaling for different substances. And basically, you see that harm to others does play a role, but does play a role more for those substances which are the most used in our societies. And overall, the proportion of harm to others is not negligible. And that is also one of the reasons why currently the different governments have been using that. One of the harm to others measures would be uh, the costs. And there had been cost studies within the Alice Rep project. And the standard results would be 1% of the GDP. And those studies found that. However, what is different is that there had been some efforts to look into the avoidable costs, reduction of consumption, the minimum price of alcohol. And those concepts can be measured also economically and can be given to governments as one of the tools in order to decide and prioritize uh, politics. Part of the problem of cost studies on a European level is that A, the uh, availability of data in different countries or regions are grotesquely different. And because of the different health care, the different uh, uh, legal systems, it is very hard and cumbersome to do such a study. And a lot of the discussion among those participants had been about those technical issues rather than on discussing the avoidable uh, costs and what we have to overall do. I still have one minute, and I would like to use it to thank you. I don't have the mic. Here's the day. Here's the lady. The lady there. Thank you, Jurgen. Thanks very much. Um, thanks also for keeping in time so well. Um, my task is now to encourage you to question, to comment on Jürgen's presentation, on Jürgen's talk. And I'm not only saying that to you here in this room, but I'm also saying that to you participating in the meeting over the internet. I will be watching uh, the two ladies who are in the rear of the room because they can see what sort of comments are coming in through the internet. Um, OK, the floor is open. Ian. When taking the floor, please introduce yourself, yes. because you may not be known. Ian Gilmore, I chair the Global Science Group. Uh, really interesting presentation, Jürgen, and you know, one conclusion could be we should forget about illicit drug use and put all our resources into alcohol and tobacco. There is a big problem with, uh, dare I use the term, addiction to prescription drugs, uh, probably a bigger problem than illicit drugs. Is it possible to quantify the damage from prescription drugs. There's Thanks, Ian. Two answers, because I think they were in basic two questions. The first is, should we forget about illicit drugs? Absolutely, categorically, no. One of the uh, examples which I would like to cite here is coming from the US. Um, there had been efforts of looking into life expectancy changes by different groups within the US. And what they found over the last 15 years is that for the, for the population which is white, non-Hispanic, that's the majority of the US population, life expectancy has reversed. Life expectancy use of UV is going up nicely. Well, now it's going a little flatter up. But in the US, it has reversed. And why does it, did it have reversed? It has reversed for the simple reason that they didn't get their policy for prescription drug abuse right. And that is, uh, we only know the causes of death, but let me give you the reason why they think this is the case. The three things which changed dramatically in mortality of those white middle-aged US people were overdose, 
and the largest overdoses were prescription opioid overdoses by far. The, but also the alcohol overdoses went up, alcohol poisoning and the heroin. Uh, second one was suicide, again linked a lot to the different kinds of substances. And the third is liver cirrhosis, and I do not have to say more to you about liver cirrhosis, for it's your training. Basically, that was the one reason. Second country within the Americas who has dropping life expectancy, Mexico. Why? Because of the mortality in homicides, because of the drug war. So we cannot forget about uh, uh, illicit drug policy because if we get it wrong, we, it can have very fatal consequences. Secondly, do we know the costs of prescription opioids? Yes, we have methodology to do that. Yes, it has been done in the US. And yes, it by far outclasses and outcosts the costs of illicit drugs, but that depends partly on how you apportion the criminal justice system. That's a real, real problem in cost studies because it is not very easy to say this policeman here is going 20% uh, for cannabis and 30% for traffic and 20% of his uh, work is for this. This is one of our biggest problems we are having currently in those cost studies. But by all means, and even if we put that out, we know that prescription opioids, at least in North America, are currently outcosting. And the, uh, to, to give you a, a little bit of background, if you look into Europe and if you look into uh, the US, the prescription opioid use per capita in the US is still about five times as much as in Europe. We just don't have pain in Europe. <laughs> okay, thanks, Jürgen. We have two other comments. One coming in from the internet. Yes, please. Hey, um, the question coming in for Jürgen is, is it not useful to separate the harms caused by the substance from the harms caused by the policy? Jürgen. Uh, <laughs> The harms co uh, caused by the policy uh, are very debatable. It's wonderful to do those exercises. We have done them, but you will not have a great agreement overall. Uh, moreover, you do not know what... Uh, uh, this is a main concept within the illicit drugs because a lot of the harms are indirectly or directly caused by policies. We know that with different policies, with needle exchanges, for example, we could reduce the HCV rate. For the legal drugs, it's still less of a problem, but it's still a problem. The problem why we are not doing that as a main overall concept for Alice Rapp is that we first want to establish the overall uh, harm which is linked to the drugs and then it's very easier to go into the different policy analysis just like the cost studies they did establish the overall cost of the drugs and then they went into the avoidable costs and that has a lot to do with different policies so this is just one step in a progression to actually quantify the costs and cost effectiveness of different policies. And that was the logical order which had been done from the WHO, WHO choice, etc. All right. Thanks, Jürgen. Uh, Maria Reinström. Yes, and I think you can guess what my questions would be because uh, we are sort of working on the global burden of disease estimates. My question is if we would have as good data about uh, illicit drug use as for tobacco alcohol, if we would be able to include more deaths and injection drug use mainly, what do you think the, the result, the outcome of that will be when we calculate the, the sort of total burden of illicit drug use? You understand my question? Not that hard to understand. No. Way harder to answer. <laughs> uh, the, the basic gist is that it would still be below alcohol, but it would be about double the current. Uh, why? A, in those numbers which I presented, uh, 
there were no numbers on uh, illicit drugs and traffic. We know very well that all psychoactive substances do re uh, ha changes in the brain, in the reaction time, etc., etc. This in itself will impact on traffic. We have meta-analysis of that, even though one big US study did not find it significant. The meta-analysis are pretty clear saying that for all illicit substances, that will be a, a, a portion which has to be added. Second is because they're illicit, a lot of the work on the disease mechanisms has not been done in the last 25 years. I mean, sorry, WHO has been silent on health effects of illicit drugs for 25 years. It was just not on the radar. And only now it's coming again. And now we are trying to catch up with the knowledge on the different disease mechanisms where we've lost two decades. All right. Thank you, Jürgen. Yes, please. Please introduce yourself first. And yes, yeah. uh, Laura, <coughs> no, you Laura, Laura Schmidt. Sure. Um, so the thing that absolutely knocks my socks off about your your presentation is that there is no accepted methodology for measuring the externalities associated with alcohol consumption. But from what you're suggesting, uh, the harms to others would be greater than those for tobacco, and about twice the harms caused to the, by, to the user, the, the, twice as much harm is caused to the, um, to the other. Uh, you were estimating around 10% harm to the other and 5% to the user. No. So, Sorry, that was it, a misunderstanding, but I, okay, I clarified. Okay, clarified that for me. So uh, anyway, regardless, when, uh, this was a game changer in the tobacco debate, right? The, being able to quantify the extent that passive smoking was, was harming others, game changer. First question, why has this not been uh, uh, provided to policymakers, and how do you think this kind of information would change the debates in Europe around alcohol control, especially relative to tobacco control? I fully believe that it would be a game changer in alcohol, in, for alcohol policy as well, for the simple reason that harm to others is something all policymakers are very interested in, have to be interested in, no matter if they are uh, of the welfare state or of the very conservative nature. Even conservatives have to protect the health of others, uh, even if they believe that they should leave the user alone or the user should go to prison or whatever the, uh, strange thoughts they have. So the basic uh, point is it will be a game changer. Why it hasn't been done? Well, uh, it, the, the problem is that all of those calculations need a lot of data input. And only now uh, in some of the stuff which has been done on road traffic uh, can we basically partial out the passengers from the drivers on a, on a level for all the 30 countries, only now do we have the data uh, that allows us to come up with a first estimate on harm to others. It took us about five years to collect all the data on pregnant mothers and uh, correlate them to the risk of FAS uh, globally. And there are not more than 40 studies, but now we can do that. So it did take us a long time. The problem we are having on harm to others is that all of those efforts are basically uh, globally. That, that means we try to estimate that globally or for a larger number of countries when there are close to no studies in the different countries. I don't know, I, we cannot rule the world, I don't know why harm to other studies have been concentrating on surveys, but those surveys <coughs> hardly translate into measures which, uh, which could be discussed here. So that's part of the problem. All the work which is done does not automatically translate into burden of disease, and only now do we get those data. That's a short answer. Okay, 
So, Alison Ritter from Australia. Thanks, Jürgen. I'm going to ask you about pleasure and well-being and the benefits associated with alcohol use, tobacco use and illicit drug use and why figures about harms and burdens and costs don't offset the benefits associated with drug use. The classic way of how we discuss burden and harm uh, is that we do separate calculations on benefits and on uh, harm. This, however, does only give the benefits in the health sector. That would be the benefits on ischemic heart disease and diabetes. Why don't they offset? Well, for those calculations which are done with the very same methodology, the basic gist of it is that uh, the benefits are about one-tenth of the harms, and when you present the net, it's not that different. Does if that include pleasure? Wait. Uh, if we go into uh, a different dimension, a well-being dimension, and pleasure, there had been huge efforts, and the uh, alcohol industry has actually put working groups with feed it with uh, million figures in order to quantify pleasure in that sense and to make it comparable with other indicators. That these efforts have failed so far. There were things like uh, happiness and uh, different times you drink alcohol with happiness indices spread out over the day, aggregated from happiness surveys, trying to be put there, putting a, a pleasurability weight on it, it failed completely. Uh, at this point, um, we do know from uh, surveys that a lot of those pleasure indicators are correlated with alcohol to, uh, to a certain drinking level, and then the curve goes up again. So it would be one of those J-shaped curves. And um, what it would do overall, it, uh, it, it is not possible to put pleasure with those burden numbers in one dimension. If you have a good idea, you probably get an uh, economic Nobel Prize or something like that. Uh, not guaranteed. But uh, it would be pretty close. At this point, we don't know. We know, however, that the curves for pleasure and for happiness indices are very close to the curves uh, for those kind of health outcomes which have beneficial effects. And so the ratio would be about the same as the ratio for ischemic diseases. That's almost the same curve. Great. Thanks, Jürgen. Uh, we are slowly but surely running out of time for this part of our program. I'd first like to check whether there are any other comments or questions from the internet side. No, no, there are not. Um, I know that there is a few people who want it to comment, to question. Uh, one person only, you please. Just quickly. Uh, Emma Dizzy, I'm a researcher at, at RAND Europe. I wondered if I could ask you to reflect a bit more on the concept of who the, the other is and whether you think it's useful to distinguish different types of other. A simple example is the regulation of smoking in public places maybe has displaced harms from those in sharing public spaces with smokers to those in the home, perhaps children. We're increasingly becoming aware of inequalities in terms of the burden of addictions and other sorts of harm. Uh, and policies which on the face of it look like they're reducing harm to others might have unintended consequences because some harms are a bit more visible and countable uh, than others. I just wondered if you had any reflections on that. Very good, thank you. Very good. simple answer about most of the current research effort of our groups is going into the differential effects of any uh, policies on different socioeconomic groups. I think any kind of policy in modern times should be reflected and should be modeled from day one in order to see what are the potential unintended consequences. I can tell you that uh, both for alcohol and for smoking, uh, 
uh, some of the policies do have unintended consequences and actually widen the gap between the rich and the poor, just to mention two groups. But of course, uh, some of those things also have to be calculated for different regional groups, for example, indigenous people, and uh, for family versus work life, etc. But th that, that is actually one of the most fruitful research efforts currently going forward, is to look at those things very clearly. Thanks, Jürgen. Thanks very much indeed for your fantastic presentation and for your comments and uh, responses to the questions. Thanks a lot. We'll move on. we we'll move on to Peter Anderson. Peter, heavy use over time. What is it all about? Yes, good question. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, in my, my presentation is really uh, taking forward some of the uh, thinking that's uh, already been published in uh, a couple of papers that were led by Jürgen Rem and other colleagues. Uh, these papers, by the way, one of them uh, won a prize, actually, from the EMCDDA as a kind of influential paper, kind of thinking about new approaches to, to drugs. Right, let's see how I get this to work. Here we go. Okay, I'm going to, in this presentation, uh, introduce, first of all, a concept called binaryism. And binaryism is a common disorder uh, of uh, healthcare practitioners and researchers who, in its worst presentation, can only count up to two. The presence or absence of a disorder or disease, but not able to count beyond. And the main symptom of this disorder, binaryism, is that it confuses disease entities with treatment decisions. Thus, for example, whilst a psychiatrist might uh, pick out certain individuals who are labelled as cases of alcohol use disorder, what is really meant is cases for alcohol use disorder treatment. For alcohol use disorder itself occurs in all grades of severity. And the idea of a sharp distinction between health and disease is in fact a medical artifact for which nature, if consulted, provides no support. Disease is nearly always a quantitative rather than a categorical or qualitative phenomenon, and hence it has no natural definitions. So what I'm going to do to continue this argument is to look at being high on blood pressure, sugar, and alcohol, and why heavy use over time should be the replacement descriptor for the term, I'm going to use the example, alcohol use disorder, but the implication would be the same for uh, all other addiction-related substance and behavior disorders. And then I will finish off by coming back to the indications for treatment to say at what level of heavy use over time is it appropriate to offer a clinical intervention, again using the example uh, of alcohol. So let's first of all think of our risk factors, uh, blood pressure, fasting plasma glucose, or sugar related to sugar, if you like, and alcohol. All of these are major causes of disability-adjusted life years and major risk factors for cardiovascular diseases, for liver diseases, uh, for diabetes, for cognitive decline. And in 2013, if you look globally at what are the world's leading risk factors for disability-adjusted life years, You've got high blood pressure at the top, you've got high fasting plasma glucose number five, and alcohol number six. If we look at each of these in turn, uh, the disease risk related to these uh, risk factors is a continuous relationship, but an exponential relationship. This is looking at the relationship between usual systolic blood pressure and stroke mortality note that the vertical axis is a logged axis. So this is an exponential relationship with the risk going up more steeply as the blood pressure goes up. We can do the same uh, with blood glucose, looking at the risk in relation to ischemic heart disease. And again, beyond a certain level um, over uh, very low levels of blood sugar, the risk of ischemic heart disease goes up. Again, an exponential relationship. The y-axis, the vertical axis, is again a log scale. 
And the same with alcohol. This is an example looking at female liver cirrhosis. Uh, it's a continuous relationship, again, an exponential relationship with the risk uh, getting, higher, getting faster at higher levels of consumption. If we come back to blood pressure, um, I want to note the point that untreated blood pressure is sometimes associated with a further progressive rise in blood pressure, often culminating in a treatment-resistant state due to associated vascular and renal damage. But that vascular and renal damage is a consequence of the high blood pressure. It is end organ damage due to the high blood pressure, which then has subsequent impacts on the blood pressure. In the same way, we can make the same argument with sugar that untreated high blood sugar levels are associated with, in this example, hippocampal damage, often culminating in increased sugar intake, the hippocampus being a primary brain substrate for control of food and sugar intake. But again, as with the blood pressure example, the hippocampal damage is a consequence of the high blood sugar level. Again, end organ damage that then leads to further uh, increase in sugar intake. And uh, this is just one example of that, looking at the relationship between blood glucose levels and human hippocampal volume from a study undertaken in New York. Uh, higher blood glucose levels, uh, lower hippocampal volume. And we can make the same argument with alcohol, that unmanaged heavy drinking can be associated with even further heavy drinking, often culminating in a more difficult to manage state due to associated brain atrophy. But again, with the same argument, the brain atrophy is end organ damage, is a consequence of the heavy drinking, which then in turn leads to a risk of further heavy drinking. This is data, for example, showing the impact of drinking on brain volume, uh, data taken from the Framingham study, looking at groups of drinkers ranging from abstainers through to high drinkers and looking at their uh, brain volume. And if we think about uh, what happens uh, with treatment and relapse from treatment, this is a very interesting study that looked, uh, looks over time at the proportion of patients without relapse uh, in relation to uh, their, brain, uh, their brain volume. And as you can see, there's a dose-response relationship that if the brain volume has been significantly reduced, the time to relapse is much quicker than if the brain volume has not been uh, significantly reduced, suggesting again that uh, the, the, the cons what we understand by dependence or relapse in this state is a consequence of brain damage Brain damage is end organ damage, which is a consequence of heavy drinking. Let's also think about the way these risk factors are distributed in populations. Uh, this is how blood pressure is distributed in populations. It's continuously distributed with an asymmetrical normal distribution to the right, so you get a tail off to the right. Um, but there's no natural cutoff point in this distribution at which, above which hypertension definitely exists and below which it does not. And you can do exactly the same if you look at plasma glucose levels. Again, it's a kind of log normal distribution, again, with no natural cutoff point where you could say someone has diabetes or they do not have diabetes. And the same with alcohol. Uh, again, alcohol distribution in populations, this is from a German population, is close to not normally distributed, skewed towards heavy drinking. And again, there is no natural cutoff point above which alcohol dependence, in inverted commas, definitely exists and below which it does not. As we know, uh, clinically, alcohol dependence or alcohol use disorder is simply defined as checklists as a score on a checklist of symptoms. You've got the old DSM-4 classification on the left and DSM-5 classification on the right. You simply ask people a load of questions, you add up the score, and if they go above a score, you say they have alcohol dependence. But there is a smooth line relationship between uh, levels of alcohol consumption and scores on this checklist. Uh, this, is, this is US data. This is using scores on the audit C instrument, which is three alcohol consumption questions, quantity, frequency, and frequency of heavy episodic drinking. 
in relation to the mean number of criteria of alcohol use disorder for men and women. And you can see that basically, the higher the consumption as measured by Audit C, the higher the number of uh, criteria of alcohol use disorder. There's no natural cutoff point. Um, and another way of showing that is just looking at the probability of dependence in relation to the score you might get on a checklist in relation, again, to your score on the Audit C, which is measuring alcohol consumption. There is a dose-response relationship. Again, no natural cutoff point that says above which or below which you have dependence. So with alcohol, the signs and symptoms that have been attributed to alcohol dependence or alcohol use disorder are actually the consequences of heavy drinking. Thus, I would argue, and as we argued also in these papers in the journal Alcohol and Alcoholism, which will obviously need to change its title, the term alcohol dependence is redundant and the term heavy use over time is all that is needed. Uh, and one could further go on and argue there are many consequences of this redefinition, but one consequence is that it might help to reduce the stigma associated with dichotomous labeling, enhancing the scope for more heavy drinking patients uh, to receive advice and treatment. Um, although I focused on alcohol, I think you can make the same argument uh, to all other substances or drugs, and in fact building on the arguments with hypertension to all other disorders and diseases. When I had my public health training at London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, I received the training from Geoffrey Rose, whose first lecture started with a simple sentence, there are no diseases. And then he went on to explain why, following some of the argumentation that I've used here. Let's move on now to treatment. Many of you will remember this cartoon from England. The best thing you can do is give up smoking, drinking, and fried food. And this uh, lad representing the normal population says to his doctor, well, what's the second best? Um, if we think about blood pressure, the threshold blood pressure determining the presence of hypertension, i.e. treatment, is defined as the level of blood pressure above which advice and treatment has been shown to reduce the development of progression of blood pressure related uh, target, organ da target organ damage. So in a treatment setting, you're making a definition based on the evidence of what actually works to improve health or reduce harm. Um, and for moderately raised blood pressure, uh, lifestyle interventions are the treatment of choice, often if people are overweight, losing weight, people taking more physical activity, unless there is evidence of target organ damage, in which case pharmacotherapy should be offered. And for higher levels of blood pressure, a combination of lifestyle advice and pharmacotherapy should be offered, always based on what does the evidence show for the improvement at certain levels of blood pressure. And we can make exactly the same argument with alcohol. The threshold level of alcohol determining the presence of a heavy drinking condition should be defined as the level of alcohol consumption above which advice and treatment has shown to be effective in reducing alcohol consumption and the development or progression of target organ damage. Uh, there are many different ways that you could make that definition. One uh, way to move forward on that is to use the threshold definitions of the European Medicines Agency, uh, which uh, has threshold one, which is an average uh, daily consumption of uh, more than 40 grams uh, per day of alcohol for women and 60 grams for men. Um, and in this uh, definition, one could argue that at this level, brief advice should be the treatment of choice unless there's evidence of target organ damage, in which case pharmacotherapy could be offered um, whereas going at the higher level, the threshold two level of the European Medicines Agency, which is 60 grams, 100 grams per day for women, men, a combination of lifestyle and vice and pharmacotherapy should be offered. Whoops. There we go. So in conclusions, I would like to argue that we should not confuse disease entities with treatment decisions. Disease is nearly always a quantitative rather than a categorical or qualitative phenomenon, and hence it has no natural definitions. I tried to argue that alcohol dependence depends on checklist scores, items of which are strongly correlated with levels of alcohol consumption. Thus, one does not need more than heavy use over time as a descriptor.
And it is not alcohol dependence that leads to more drinking. In alcohol dependence, it's brain atrophy, which is a result of target organ damage due to heavy drinking. And brain atrophy itself is then related to more heavy drinking. And in this last conclusion, all of those are underlined, are also not binary conditions that exist within continua. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Peter. That was a very clear argument for all of us to change our thinking and to get rid of the number of terms that, have be, that we have been using over centuries. So, in a way, this is a historical moment, isn't it? Are we going to adapt and use that term, heavy use over time, as the critical thing to think about? I'm sure there will be many questions and comments on your presentation, Peter. Uh, people from the internet are also very much invited to comment. Uh, but I'll first go to George, who has already raised his hand for commenting. George. Uh, George Woody from the US. Um, there's an emphasis on increasing treatment, you know, particularly in the U.S. And how would you operationalize that so that a treatment provider could get paid? I mean, those categories, uh, the payments from insurance companies in the U.S. Are, are based on those categories, you know, intensive outpatient or residential. So could you comment on that I mean, important I mean, issue? Yes. Uh, if you take the example of blood pressure, I mean, in, in, and I'll use the example of, of England, um, there, there is an organization called the National Institute of Health and Clinical Excellence that sets parameters and guidelines uh, for prevention and treatment of many conditions. And they have guidelines around the management of blood pressure. And those guidelines are very much based on what I illustrated here, which is at certain levels where we know that uh, advice and treatment um, is helpful in leading to health gain. Those are the cutoff levels at which healthcare providers should be offering advice and treatment. So those cutoff levels based on those guidelines can become the criteria on which physicians could be reimbursed for offering the treatment. And you could do the same with alcohol. You could make an agreement, uh, again, based on the evidence at what levels of drinking and or target organ damage um, uh, would uh, advice and treatment give benefit to people and say it's on these levels, according to these guidelines, uh, that we would uh, reimburse treatment. Of course, there's always a problem with this reimbursement issue is that you know, individual providers will also want to use their own clinical judgment and not always be completely stuck with a guideline because they may feel for some individual people that they want to alter that. That's a difficulty with the reimbursement system. Uh, it's not a difficulty when you're, when you're working in a health system where you're not funded item of service like that. But I think you could follow the model of uh, blood pressure and, and have uh, agreed cutoff levels based on clinical guidelines. Okay. Anyone else? Yes, Matilda, please. Thanks. Thanks for your presentation. Uh, it was really interesting, and I'm, I'm also fascinated by your research and this uh, concept. Uh, three things that I uh, was thinking about, which I've discussed with you before, so it's something that you're familiar with. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, in what kind of situations and context do you see it replacing as a descriptor? If I understand you correctly, mm, at least clinical settings, maybe public policies, things like in, in these kind of contexts. And putting uh, these uh, aside, uh, one would think that there are other uses of these concepts that um, and would you see that there are some benefits of them? Um, for example, if we look at the popular representations of the problems, the word addiction has increased a lot since the 1990s, and it has some kind of function there. And also, uh, as Robin Room also has written about this kind of mystical or unexplainable force, so this kind of signifiers and words uh, like dependence, relapse, and addictions, um, they might have some uh, important value for an experience uh, perspective. And the third one is a comment about the stigma argument, which I don't, um, which is uh, 
Mm, I'm not fully convinced because uh, stigma can also appear when there is not a word uh, for a situation that you experience. And also, if we change the signifier, we are still grouping people, even though the signifier is changed. So these are just some thoughts. Thank you, Marilyn. Peter. Uh, I, mean, <coughs> I would only want to argue that, that, I mean, I think the fact that presenting this whole concept as a continuum, in a way, helps to try and make the argument that we are all in this together. We are all common in this continuum. Um, there are people who are at one end of that continuum who are going to run into more difficulty, who have a risk of you know, target organ damage and harm to themselves and to their lives. But a continuum is a, is a representation that this is a concept or a, a thing that affects us all within society. And we are all responsible for all. Um, and we know that because um, as societies shift, those continua or the distribution of that continua can shift. We know that the behavior of groups of us has huge impact on the behavior of others. Uh, and you know, the, all the kind of network analysis of the Framingham study demonstrates that if you're in a network of heavy drinkers, the chances are in the future you will be are more likely to be a heavy drinker. Whereas if you are in a network of abstainers, the chances are in the future you're more likely to be a lighter <coughs> drinker. So I, I think r rather than sort of labeling people, dichotomizing things, this idea is saying that, th that this is actually not the case, that this is about a continuum. And I think that that sort of helps us sort of think maybe more sympathetically for all of us to do something about it. Okay. Thanks, Peter. Lots of comments. We have about, what, something like two, three minutes left for this part. But there's also at the end of, well, before the end of the session, another 15 minutes for a more general discussion, so we can come back to this also. I saw Jürgen first, Ian Gilmore, and then there were a few people. But may I suggest that we take only two comments for the time being and come back to these others perhaps at the end, before the end of the session. Jürgen. I will do only one. Uh, there is experimental evidence and uh, that if you stress and teach people on continuous concepts that stigmatization is decreasing several experiments, and they've tried to link this experimental evidence in surveys on stigmatization of health conditions where they once were described at more continuous and less, uh, and, and once binary, uh, that's a German group of Stromerus, and in those surveys with classical health conditions, the same results come. So we know at least from a short term that there is experimental and non-experimental evidence that the continuum is a decisive force in creating stigma. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Jürgen. A decisive force in helping reduce stigma, yeah. yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Peter, like you, I don't see life as being black and white and there are a continuum of, of grey, but if you take say, people presenting with alcoholic cirrhosis. Not necessarily a binary condition, you can get good cirrhosis and bad cirrhosis. But about a third of them will say, oh gosh, I've been drinking too much, fair cop, I'll stop, and they just stop. And, and, and then in, in the two thirds that have difficulty, there are those who might be able to stop for five, 10 years, and then they have a couple of drinks and they're back on the, you know, on, on, on the wheel again. <coughs> and so it, clinically, the, the, there are, groups that, 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 that stand out. Now, you might say those who are, show the signs of what we used to call addiction have, have caused brain damage, but if you look at the genetics, of course, and genes are binary, one from the mother, one from the father, <laughs> you know, there, there is, uh, there's quite a strong genetic element in, our, in what was called alcohol dependence. Does that cause you difficulty? No, I mean, the... the um no, no, none of that causes me difficulty. I mean, it's the same of managing any clinical condition. I mean, people will vary on a continuum of their harm. And, and, and what 
and how they get better and what needs to be done to help them help them get better. Um, it means as the provider that you obviously need to continue that interaction with that person to help them in all of those decisions and, and keep an eye on them so that you know if something goes wrong, you're there to sort of help them get better again. So I, I don't see any, any problem with that. I mean, there is um, a lot of the variability around propensity to um, uh, having, running into problems of all of these substances, of course, has a genetic component. But ge genes don't are, do not act for, for the, in the vast majority of cases. Genes do not act singly; they act in, as continua. We are biological beings. The whole process of natural selection is based on variability, um, and the, 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 because so many different genes are involved around all of these things, it, it, it is never going to be. For the most of the time, it's never going to be the case that where you've got you know one gene causes one issue. No, because it's a complex interplay, and that will also act on a continuum. So, apart from the fact of being male or female, which again is not absolute. I mean, you know, again there's variation there. <laughs> um, it it doesn't worry me. No. Thanks, Peter. Okay, may I suggest that we move on to our next item on the agenda. Uh, and then our next speaker is Dirk Lachenmeyer. He comes from Karlsruhe, from the German Institute. He's a food chemist and uh, the institute in Karlsruhe where he works is assisting the government in determining the toxicity of alcohol, food substances, etc. The ranking of the substances of addiction is the subject of Dirk's presentation. Dirk, the floor is yours. Yes, uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I was asked to uh, present you the results from Alice Rapp on the toxicology and ranking of addictive drugs. Um, previous approaches uh, are of course available and I must come now back to the most famous slide of addiction science with which Jürgen uh, already showed you this morning. This was basically what we had a starting point in our uh, uh, ranking of uh, drugs uh, uh, study. And uh, as Jürgen mentioned, uh, this evaluation which has alcohol uh, with the highest risk uh, was uh, under major criticism at the time and uh, till now, I think, because this ranking is not based on uh, something that can be measured, but uh, this was made by putting 30 experts in a room together and let them score all of uh, these drugs after certain criteria. And so with Alice Rapp, we had the idea to use another method for drug ranking, which is uh, rather based on a, a, let's say, more scientific method. And this approach which we use is called margin of exposure. What is the margin of exposure? This is uh, uh, quite a common method in other fields. Um, there's even a, a WHO monograph uh, on uh, risk assessment that also uh, uh, describes the margin of exposure method. And uh, this monograph uh, suggests that the margin of exposure is uh, a method for the risk manager for priority setting. And this was uh, exactly what we wanted with Alice Rapp. We wanted to look at the different addictions and uh, uh, sort them according to a priority for, for a policy or risk management action. Now, how is the margin of exposure calculated? It's here the simple formula, more or less simple. Uh, you need uh, two uh, things to calculate the, the MOE, which is the abbreviation. Uh, you need a so-called benchmark dose uh, and the human exposure. Uh, the margin of exposure itself, I'm too slow, uh, then has no, no, no unit, but it's, it's just a number. I will show you some examples later. Uh, here I have a figure to 
to make a better visualization what, what means the margin of exposure. Um, basically, you have uh, two curves. Uh, uh, this is uh, the exposure curve, uh, how much alcohol, for example, uh, is consumed in the population. And uh, you have another curve, which uh, is uh, the, the toxic effect we want to study. And uh, the margin of exposure is the, the, the distance uh, between those curves. And as its uh, risk assessment method, we, we do not take the average of the risk curve, but we take uh, the so-called benchmark dose for 10% for uh, response. If we think about mortality at this point, 100% uh, would die. This is 0%. And here we use the, the, the point uh, for 10% as a benchmark. And uh, to be still on the safer side, we use even the, the lower confidence uh, level of this dose. How uh, can the uh, margin of exposure uh, be interpreted? Um, um, uh, the MOE is exactly run if the exposure is the same as uh, the uh, benchmark dose, and then those two curves would be the same. So the level is one. And of course, it, it's desired that the, desirable that the curves are as far away as possible so that the risk is low, so that your exposure would not re reach the risk level. And so, uh, it is a desire to have an MOE above 100. Uh, this is in, uh, for normal uh, substances like, uh, like food additives, uh, you would, uh, you would uh, call them safe if they have an MOE above 100. So if you drink your Coca-Cola, which has uh, aspartame in it, uh, you can be certain that the MOE is above 100, otherwise the food additive would not have been approved. Uh, for carcinogens, uh, there's uh, a difference uh, uh, because uh, uh, they are also um, have a risk at uh, because uh, basically one molecule can have a risk so that you would, for carcinogens, you would have a uh, desired uh, uh, much higher level above 10,000, uh, like acrylamide in, in uh, fries, you would like to have an MOE above 10,000. Now, what was the result of our drug uh, ranking? First, we have to somehow uh, get this benchmark dose level. Uh, this was now the first problem because uh, for all these drugs, uh, except some exceptions like alcohol, uh, we were not able to find any other endpoint than mortality. Uh, and so uh, to have a common uh, uh, element, we, we uh, used mortality for all these drugs so, so that the comparison uh, would be possible. And so here you see that heroin is by far the uh, compound with the, with the smallest uh, dose uh, uh, which would be toxic and uh, this goes up to, to alcohol which in, in uh, relation to the benchmark dose is uh, about a factor of 500 higher than heroin. So if you only look at this uh, toxic dose, you would, uh, uh, this suggests that alcohol is not such a risk. But uh, we have the exposure side uh, to the margin of exposure. And uh, as alcohol is, uh, the exposure is so high, this now uh, let's uh, brings in the MOE calculation, brings alcohol as I mentioned in, the, in my uh, first words here, to the, to the highest position even. So we have, in this slide, we have uh, uh, classified uh, the high risk, medium risk, low risk, according to the margin of exposure, uh, 
as I have mentioned, and so we have uh, these substances which are dark red here, which fall into the high risk uh, category for, for tobacco. Our evaluation is even only based on uh, nicotine and not any of the other compounds uh, in tobacco. But those four, alcohol, heroin, cocaine, and tobacco, are uh, the highest risks in our evaluation. And then uh, ecstasy and methamphetamine follow, and cannabis here is even in the, in the low risk category uh, with a level above 100. This was uh, for individual consumption. Uh, now on this slide, uh, it's a bit different. It's for, for the population uh, basis. And here you also uh, can see that we have uh, uh, calculated different scenarios uh, for uh, tolerant uh, users, for example. And uh, you can also see the, the standard deviations in our calculations uh, which are quite uh, high because of the, the large uncertainty in the, in the data we obviously have. But uh, also in this case, uh, alcohol comes on the first position and then heroin, cocaine and so on till we get to uh, cannabis at the last position. This is uh, basically the, the same uh, slide, but in another uh, uh, figure where perhaps the difference this can be better seen. We also have a logarithmic uh, scale, and uh, this perhaps is, um, is also the major difference to the expert judgment I have shown you in the uh, beginning that the, the differences in MOE uh, due to the logarithmic mix scale are uh, much larger than uh, what, what the experts judged, which only had a scale from 1 to uh, 100, I think. Um, now I want to come uh, to some scenarios we have uh, calculated. Um, uh, for example, we were interested in uh, what the MOE can tell us about uh, reducing the strength of uh, beverages, uh, of alcoholic beverages. And for example, here we have uh, compared normal beer, which about 5.5% uh, volume with light beer, which has uh, about 1.5% uh, volume. And uh, for two, <coughs> Uh, drinking scenarios, one uh, glass of beer per day and four bottles uh, per day. And uh, here you see the, the MOEs which are resulting um, for, the, for the normal beer. Uh, the, the value for one glass would be 3.7. Uh, and uh, with the light beer, you would have 15. Uh, which uh, would uh, be above a value of 10, and uh, so this doesn't fall in, into the, the high-risk category anymore. Um, and even with four, four bottles of this light beer, sorry, I'm also too slow, uh, uh, an MOE below one cannot be reached, even if you drink two liters of this light beer. Um, what is the difference uh, between alcohol and tobacco? Um, the tobacco industry suggests that tobacco smoke contains nothing with MOE below 10. There are uh, several papers from the tobacco industry available that have used the margin of exposure for all those uh, compounds that can be found in tobacco. And so we were interested to, to repli replicate, so to say, these industry uh, studies and uh, uh, look uh, what, what, what perhaps have they mis missed. Uh, first, uh, uh, we now look only at alcohol. Um, in alcohol, you also have a mixture of uh, several compounds. And for all these compounds, we have uh, calculated the margin of exposure for four drinks per day. 
And here you see the result, only ethanol is marked red, which falls into the uh, risk category. And almost all other substances that can be found in uh, alcoholic beverages are above a level of 100 and so uh, do not pose a risk to the consumer, perhaps except uh, lead, which also is between uh, 10 and 100. But, but ethanol is clearly here the, the culprit and uh, the only thing basically in alcoholic beverages that uh, poses a risk to the consumer. Um, so this was a figure basically from the tobacco industry for tobacco, from a study from Reynolds Tobacco from 20, 2012. And here we have those, all those compounds that can be found in tobacco smoke, and all those have margin of exposure uh, higher than 10. It's also, a, again, a logarithmic scale, or even those nitrosaminic compounds that were uh, often suggested to have a risk for the smoker. They even have levels over 10,000 and do not even pose a large cancer risk. And now here in the red bars, you see our calculations. Uh, the only difference is that we included nicotine. And uh, dependent on what endpoint for nicotine you use, and nicotine by far is a, has the highest risk in uh, tobacco smoke. Uh, if you use the most sensitive endpoint, uh, which would be heart rate acceleration in humans, uh, you even would be with the margin of exposure below uh, 0.1. And if you use the, the animal study similar to the other drugs we have, you are still below 1. This is another figure for electronic cigarettes now. In the e-cigarettes, you have uh, all those other compounds, of course, go away, but you have some uh, other compounds not found in the smoke like ethylene, ethylene glycol, uh, pro, pro, different propane di diols, and glycerol, which are the solvents in which nicotine and other su substances uh, uh, is diluted and uh, which can be found in as major uh, compounds in those e-liquids. And also for uh, those electronic cigarettes, uh, we were unable to find any compound that has a risk besides, again, uh, nicotine. So you know that the tobacco industry papers say that 90% uh, uh, of the effects of cigarette smokes are unknown. Perhaps uh, nicotine is uh, having uh, uh, these effects. And it's interesting, in all, almost all risk assessment studies of uh, tobacco smoke Nicotine is always excluded. <laughs> Perhaps this is a, I, I really uh, cannot uh, 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 gather why they have excluded nicotine. Um, what does this now mean? Um, uh, we should prioritize measures on drugs with MOE below 100 because as the WHO manual says, the MOE is basically a method to prioritize uh, 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 substances with different risks. So most efforts uh, should go to alcohol, tobacco, co cocaine, or heroin. Um, to alcohol and tobacco, because uh, the human use of the crown forms is uh, not following the considerations of risk, meaning it is way too high, and uh, this could be uh, better with different forms, uh, such as e-cigarettes and light beer, if the same pattern of use is up upheld. And for cocaine and heroin, uh, our analysis showed that the potential risk per use is, is just too high, so uh, those two should be avoided. Um, what we, uh, what we need for uh, future research is uh, that uh, uh, we need, of course, we have done only mortality and we need other toxicological endpoints for all the drugs. We also need better exposure data 
daily dosages if possible. And uh, we have found that nicotine has been overlooked in the risk assessment of tobacco products and needs urgent re-evaluation. Re for example, IARC uh, already has put it on the high priority list for evaluation. And research into drug forms with reduced amount of toxicants such as alcohol reduced spirits, nicotine reduced tobacco uh, is necessary. And at the end I want to show you what now is available here in Spain. There is a, a manufacturer that, uh, that uh, now manufactures alcohol-free spirits even. Uh, uh, we tested some of them, but uh, currently I must say that uh, uh, you, you really can uh, taste the difference, so <laughs> this, this is not a, a, a good placebo uh, for alcohol, so we currently would suggest that it's the, the, the better way would just to reduce the alcohol content a bit, perhaps gradually over time, than to directly go to zero percent. Okay, thank you for your thank attention. You. Thank you, Derek. Derek doesn't have any shares, of course, in this. Uh, of all no. free spirits or whatever. Okay, thank you very much. It's very nice, I think, that we have in Alistrap this perspective of toxicology into the overall approach, and I think we have to be very grateful for your work in this regard. Uh, we have a few minutes for comments, questions on this, is on this very issue, and then I'll pass on to the more general questions or comments that you may have on the overall session. One, two, three. I'll go to Robert first. Thank you very much. Uh, very interesting talk. Just uh, commenting on the nicotine side of things. Of course, we do have um, very good epidemiology, um, which uh, tells us that uh, over time, the dose that nicotine uh, that people get from their tobacco products, um, uh, in that dose, for example, in countries like Sweden where they use snus, then you don't see an increased risk of mortality. I think it, what that raises is an in, in interesting um, methodological issue around, the, uh, around this approach, which is in focusing on acute toxicity, um, one, for, one, is, one is for certain substances, certainly like tobacco, um, uh, somewhat missing the uh, the main harms that arise from the product. I mean, it is. I, I'm not sure that there ever has been a case of someone literally smoking themselves to death as a result of acute nicotine poisoning, um, because it's something that you can titrate very well. Um, and by the time you get to a point where it's causing you acute uh, harm, then you often vomit and pass out. So I just wondered to what extent you know. Is, this um, methodology is really translating terribly well into that particular domain. As the, the slide I showed you on the tobacco was not acute effects, it was even chronic effects for all those compounds. Yeah, I'm just thinking about to you, what you were saying about nicotine and the, uh, the, the margin of exposure uh, factor there. Um, yeah, the, the, the margin of exposure for those compounds in tobacco they were derived not for, for the mortality endpoint, but for the most sensitive endpoint for all those compounds, mm. which mostly was cancer in, for most of the compounds. Mm. It was ba it's mostly based on long-term animal mm. experiments. Mm. But we do have good epidemiology, though. And this is an, in, I mean, I think one of the, this is, there's often a tension between toxicology and epidemiology. Mm. And uh, I, I mean, it's a point for discussion, I think, uh, you know, to take forward. And, to, and what I would recommend, I think, is, is trying to find a rapprochement to see, you know, where the toxicology and the epidemiology seem to diverge. Mm. What is the reason for that? And, you know, what does it mean? Right. Okay. Thanks, uh, Robert. Reinhardt. Hi there. Thanks for a good talk. Um, as we discussed before, we have some issues with the um, endpoint being just mortality, and you actually mentioned it also in your last slide. As Jurgen already said, uh, death is overrated. Um, and 
Um, if you look at cannabis uh, as a fact of the matter, um, it's now the number one drug where young people are treated for in large parts of the world. Uh, also, if you look at school dropout, it's highly associated with both alcohol and cannabis abuse. So I'm not so convinced that it's really a success that this popular paper has been cited so often because it's probably for the wrong reasons. And that is that cannabis is innocent and spreading the wrong message to the world because definitely it's not if you take other endpoints than just mortality. So I really think that maybe the clinical wisdom in the other panel was better than just a single-minded mortality-based measure. Thanks, Reinhard. Derek? Um. I think we have discussed this before. I have advertised for years in the Alice Rap project that you give me better data on other endpoints, but nothing came back. And so it's just what we have, and it is as it is. We clearly have not put it into the social media that uh, cannabis is safer than alcohol. This was uh, interpretation of uh, someone else. Okay. One more comment. Yes, please. Um, I want to ask you a little bit about, so, hold on, hold on. about measure, measuring exposure, uh, because uh, you're not taking blood samples on everyone and figuring out exactly, in a traditional toxicological way, how much nicotine is in the bloodstream versus how much ethanol. And so this is population-based data, and of course the uh, exposure would be dependent on route of administration, uh, speed of, you know, in many, many conditions. So could it be that um, some of this evidence, at least the numbers that you have now, are being impacted? I mean, in addition to this chronic versus acute effects issue that needs to be teased out, could there be um, bias due to uh, differences in the ways that bodies are exposed to these different substances? Yes, we have done the exposure side uh, in two ways. We have just used the monitoring data that were available from WHO, the European uh, uh, institutions, how much is consumed population-wide. Uh, and uh, the second thing was we have just looked what a normal drug user would, uh, would normally use and made minimum maximum and then made uh, using Monte Carlo methods we have just uh, uh, calculated iterations also to get an average uh, for our result. Okay. Thanks, Derek. There's one comment from a participant elsewhere in the world. Would you please start saying who this is and what the question or comment is, please? Okay, this is um, from Gabriel in Sweden. Right. Okay. Um, the question is, having a risk indicator where the highest risk has the lowest numerical number is in conflict with most people's understanding. Right. Do, right. do you not think it would be better if the product with the highest risk would have the highest number? So perhaps this is more a presentational issue and, and concerns how yeah, to I, get the public I, to really understand the, the idea and concept. I, I think okay. I have, Thank you. Uh, uh, I have uh, it's, it's correct, but the, the method is, was developed, I think, in '86, and it's in the WHO monograph, and if you want to change it, it will take 30 years again. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, right. Okay. All right. Thanks very much, Derek. Thanks very much indeed for this excellent presentation and this new perspective on YouTube. Thank you. We have another 10 minutes or so left uh, before we go to lunch. And these 10 minutes we can use for any comments that you wanted to make on previous presentations and you had no chance to or overall comments on the theme of this session. Why worry about addiction? Jacek, Tamiko, Jacek, Moskalevich. You have the floor, Jacek. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, 
Actually, I would like to come back to the discussion we had of the presentation from Jürgen on potential unintended consequences of these attempts to reframe addictions in general. The classical example is a question of increasing visibility of harm to others or from others. It may facilitate and promote public health interest in the political reality, but it also put more blame and moral accusation on those who drink and harm not only themselves, but also others. So it is very likely to produce increased stigmatization, increased ghettoization. Now we see ghettos where people drink a lot and smoke a lot and we just evade these quarters of the society or of the city. So are we ready for considering these unintended effects while bravely changing or reframing our discourse about addictions. Right. Thanks, Jacek. Jürgen. It is true that um, harm to others is something which may increase some of the effects of uh, stigmatization. However, a lot of the harm to others can be avoided without avoiding drinking at all. For example, if I take alcohol, uh, the, uh, it is very clear that if you separate certain environments and if you do not take the road after the fifth beer or after the, uh, some, some, some kind of amount, you can still drink five beers. You're not allowed to go to uh, the car. I think that stigmatization of drivers who kill others on the road uh, or potentially kill others on the road is something which we can probably live with uh, better than uh, all those deaths. The point is, overall, that I believe that uh, whereas the harm to others we can almost entirely separate the consequences via environmental uh, measures. With uh, the, the, the consequence about treatment, the consequence about drinking by yourself, this is way harder to do. And so I think the overall balance on shifting on harm to others will be there. And, by, uh, and we are not shifting into full harm to others as the main measure. As with tobacco, uh, tobacco deaths on, from, on, on others are about 6% of the deaths of the overall tobacco deaths. In alcohol, deaths will be about probably, once we do the calculation correctly, I would say 15% of the deaths of alcohol. So, so in the WHO monograph or whatever those uh, books are there, we basically still will have 10 pages on the harm uh, to the drinker and maybe four pages on harm to others. I'm not suggesting that harm to others should be the only measure. Okay. Thanks, Jürgen. Domenico. The three of you brought very nice evidence, and this is turning point in science. Uh, my question for you three is the same. What are the next steps to move from science to reframing policies now? Okay. Jürgen, would you like to start? Well, I mean, I just will refer to one concept, and I'm sure that the others will pick up the rest. Um, we are living in a society which is classic capitalist society based on economic principles. One of the economic principles which has been around for about 100 years now is, uh, was invented by a economist called Pigou, and it's a Pigouvian tax. And the Pigouvian tax could be done, um, the Pigouvian tax basically says that taxation should be commensurate to the harm which something which is sold 
uh, is actually uh, producing. And, to, and it's a normal capitalist measure. It has nothing to do with those uh, bad socialists who want to destroy our world. Uh, it's an, and uh, what, one of the ways how we could do that is we could implement Pigouvian taxes based on the attributable harm for different substances and we could actually make this, uh, formalize this. If we create something like a footprint, it will be uh, introduced later. And uh, that would be one measure which would be commensurate with the current system, which would be science-based. Everybody who don't believe those kinds of harms can challenge it. it they're, they're open numbers, but not even the alcohol industry or the tobacco industry uh, is actually debating the kind of figures we are presenting. They're debating some, some underpoints, but not the overall figure. And uh, so it, it there is a certain consensus to, to raise something like a Pigovian tax. Okay. Peter, what's the implications? I think it's about uh, d disseminating the concept more widely in, uh, through all sorts of communication channels that affect uh, ordinary people, that affect academics, that affect people that advise and make policy. I think stressing, in my view, uh, that the use of drugs and the subsequent harm all exist within continua. We are all in it together. And to use that as one more uh, tool, if you like, to help address the issue of stigma uh, so that people, rather than being excluded through stigma, are included and that people who do not get access to uh, help and treatment because of stigma get access to help and treatment. So I think, I think it's the, the message in terms of a governance one is to get this flow of ideas through all the communication channels that we uh, can use. Okay, thanks, Jürgen. Derek. Yes, I fully agree with uh, Jürgen and Peter. Um, I can only uh, say that so much that uh, our margin of exposure model, uh, with all the limitations it has and that which we have discussed, has basically fully confirmed the earlier uh, expert evaluation. And so it's really time, I think this is 10 years or more, uh, 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 then this was published, it's, it's, uh, I think it's time to act on, on those suggestions. Okay, thanks very much, Dirk. It's now one minute to one. It's a beautiful time to stop and think about, not only just think about, but go for lunch up. Sorry. Just to say, very building on that, yeah, no, at 1600 tomorrow afternoon, we have a whole session that's going to be talking about how we use all the science to reframe. So sure. I hope people will hang in here and bring your ideas, spirit, energy to that session. Personally, I have a plan I'd like to introduce about a, in a major social marketing effort to uh, reframe uh, the way we're talking about all these issues. Still a bit of a mouthful to say, well, oh, darling, I have to go to my heavy use over time clinic today. <laughs> And Franklin, and Franklin is going to chair that session. Um, okay, uh, I think we had a very, very good start of our debate. Uh, great presentations, and if you look at it a little bit from outside, the observation has to be, I think, that Alice Rapp, whatever you think or say about it, has given the opportunity to produce a lot of new knowledge, new perspectives, and I think that's what you saw also this morning. I think we have to be grateful for the presenters, for Jürgen, Peter, Dirk, who represent in a way that stream, that push for new knowledge, and have actually done it. So thank you very much, Jürgen, Peter, Dirk. <laughs>